I've got the sun right in my face though. Today we're going to the Tower of London. We're going to do the water um, uh, tour and uh, see the crown jewels and hear about how people were beheaded here and what an awful place it was. And, um, Oscar and I have done the tour with the Beefeaters before, but um, it's Emerson's first time. So, uh, yeah, we're excited for him to see it. He's on his way. And we're waiting for him to arrive now. And then we'll start. And then we're going to the, the Handel Hendrix House Museum. They actually lived in the same house for a while. Not at the same time, obviously, but, uh, but in the same house. And so... Not in the same house. In the same apartment complex thing. Not the same house. I think Handel was upstairs and Hendrix was downstairs. Actually, I think it's the other way around yeah. from what I read. But um, but in any event, we'll, uh, we're, we're going to go see that. And that'll be exciting. I tried to see that last time I was here last spring. The museum was closed for renovations, and as it happens, the um, uh, the museum, the Handel uh, Hendrix Museum, just reopened on January fourth, so we got lucky. So. Yep. Hello, guys. Welcome back to the channel. Um, like she said, we are at the tower. We're gonna do the tour of the castle. We're just waiting for Emerson to arrive because he had a late start this morning. But the entrance is right behind me there. And we're going to go in and uh, see the jewels and the history and everything that happened here. A lot of terrible things from the stories. So at this moment, if you don't mind, please liking and subscribing to the channel if you haven't. We would very much appreciate it. We are a growing channel and we are looking for subscribers. So if you can do us a favor and subscribe to the channel and help us grow this small channel, we'll very much appreciate it. We are looking to get 100 subscribers, hopefully, with this video. If you should be so inclined to hit that subscribe button and help us grow this channel to where we want it to go. Uh, thank you in advance and we'll see you on the tour. Okay, uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Morning. 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 My name is Yeoman Warder Spy Cabot. I am one of the 35 Yeoman Warders, beef eaters as you know us as, that live and work here in His Majesty's Wild Parson Fortress, the Tower of London, a World Heritage Site. Right, for the next four and a half hours, I'm going to be your guide. <laughs> you wanted to go to Harry Potter World, didn't you? <laughs> anyway, for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to be your guide. Take around the tower, point out to the buildings. Uh, right, before we all start, we've got any American friends with us? Any Americans at all? Now listen, going to be using a few confusing words over the next 45 minutes. <laughs> and the first one is history. <laughs> because we've got lots of it. <laughs> Haven't we, Brits? Yay! You Brits want to give me a hurrah? Hurrah! You Americans give me a yeehaw! Yeehaw! <laughs> God love them, eh? Right, where does it all start? Way back in the year of 1066, when William, Duke of Normandy, better known as William the Conqueror, he defeated the Anglo-Saxon King Harold at the Battle of Hastings. Now, William was crowned King William I of England on Christmas Day of that year, but he continued to fight his newly conquered subjects who didn't take too kindly to Norman domination. Now, William was looking for somewhere to rule from, so he chose a site just inside the eastern city wall where once an old Roman fort had stood. It was here in 1078 that William authorised the building of his first royal palace in fortress in England and it's now known as the White Tower. And it's situated at the heart of this <coughs> fortress and you're going to get a much better view once we get inside the inner walls. And to the north of this wall stand two strong bastions, Legs Mount and Brass Mount. Inside and on top of would have been mounted cannons to defend the fortress from attack from coming from that direction. And also we've got the moat, which we're now standing at the moment, and this would have been filled with water. Now this was dug during the reign of King Edward I, and the engineer, a Master Walters, an expert in these matters, 
He was brought over especially from Holland. Now it would have been 120 feet wide and when fully excavated, 15 feet deeper than you can see it today. <laughs> it was designed to take advantage of the, tide, of the river tidal Thames, twice a day flowing into around the moat keeping it clean. And initially that system seemed to work rather well, but with all the rubbish and excrement from the city, that's poo for the Americans, <laughs> and the wide drains of Shoreditch and Houndsditch, the system soon quickly failed. And this became the largest cesspit in London. Oh. Oh, a yeah. source of pestilence for those living nearby, especially the soldiers of the Tar garrison. When in 1846 the Duke of Wellington, he was then the constable of the tower, he requested permission from Queen Victoria to have this moat drained. That was granted, so the Duke then had the moat filled with sand and oyster shells, up to the level you can see today. Now the crown jewels and royal regalia have been safely stored here since 1303. The Royal Mint was located within these walls, where all the coins of the realm were produced. It was the site of the first Royal Observatory for the study of stars and planets, so that has moved to Greenwich in the 17th century. It was an armory for the storage of warlike stores and provisions. And official records and papers of kings and queens' courts are stored here to the middle of the 19th century, when they had moved away to form the public records office. And it was the Royal Menagerie, or Zoo, where the Royal Collection of Exotic Animals were kept, so they moved to Regent's Park in 1835. But last, no means least, this must rank as the most famous prison complex anywhere in the world. Now, thinking about prisoners, some of you today, you might have arrived on the tube station. The tube station's up here. To the left of the tube station is a small park called Trinity Green, and known as Tower Hill. That site saw many executions between the 14th and 18th century, but much consternation was raised in the city when King Edward IV had a permanent scaffold erected in 1465. Over the years, no less than 75 men of noble birth were to lose their heads up there by the means of block and axe. The first victim was Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was brought there by the hands of peasants in 1381 for daring to introduce poll tax. <laughs> Seven years later, in 1388, the first legal execution was that of Sir Simon Burley. And by remarkable coincidence, <coughs> the last victim in 1747 was yet another Simon, Simon Fraser an 80-year-old Scottish Lord who had supported the Second Jacobite Rebellion. Now the question is, have we got any Simons with us this afternoon? <laughs> any Simons at all? Not too late to get a refund on your ticket, John. <laughs> Let's pause and think about what the scene would have been like up there on a day of an execution. Thousands would have gathered around the race platform supporting the scaffold to witness the proceedings. The prisoner, having delivered his final words and said his prayers, he would kneel down and place his head on the block of oak. He would then give a word of signal. And the executioner would bring down his axe, hopefully severing his victim's head with one clean stroke. The executioner would then pick up the severed, still bleeding head and hold it aloft for all to see. Turning to the assembled crowd, the crowd would gasp. Thank you, madam. <laughs> All of the crowd would gasp. <laughs> Behold the head of a traitor, so die all traitors. God save the king. God save the king. Listen, we had a coronation here last May. <laughs> so a bit of pride, we'll try that again, shall we? Behold the head of a traitor, so die all traitors. God save the king. God save the king. Who's shouting out too early, for goodness sake? <laughs> His head would then be impaled on a soldier's <laughs> pike, carried through the streets of London towards London Bridge. In those days, the only bridge to cross the River Thames. His head would then be displayed over the entrance of the city at the sign of the fate of all would-be traitors. Meanwhile, his headless corpse would be taken down, placed into a small handcart, brought back to the tower, where it would be quickly buried in an unmarked grave in the chapel royal of St Peter ad Vincula. And you can visit that chapel at the end of the tour. OK, we're now standing in the outer ward of the Tower of London. That's to say we're between the inner and the outer defensive wall. The inner wall there is 50 feet tall, the outer behind you there is 28 feet thick. Down the street to my right is Mint Street, 
So called because until 1810, all the coins in the realm were designed to produce. And the buildings that contain the mint, they're known as the casemates, or houses within the wall. And they now serve as accommodation for some of my fellow Yeoman Water colleagues and their families. These are all beef eater houses, way along here, on a bar on that side, and these were there while it'd be my family. Did you all know that beef eaters lived here in the Tower of London? Yes. yes. Do you care that beef eaters live in the Tower of London? Yes. yes. It's an ancient home as his castle. Just wish that this was my castle. <laughs> <laughs> Behind you there's a tall narrow archway known as the Sally Port or Royal Entrance, beyond which is a small drawbridge leading out to the Queen's Stairs and directly down to the River Thames. Now, rather than travel for busy now streets of London, royalty and nobility, they would sail in their impressive barges up and down the river, mooring alongside those stairs, give me access to the tower. Those gates over there are original, and they date back more than 700 years. It's exactly there where King Henry VIII greeted his second wife, Anne Boleyn, prior to her coronation in May of 1533. That's where King Henry got around one knee and said to Anne, I'm going to love you for the rest of your life. <laughs> you see what I did. <laughs> Anne was fated to return to this tower some three years later, for a very different reason, through a very different gate. Now behind me is the bell tower, which is built during the reign of King Richard I, and it derives its name from the small white belfry on top. That contains one of the oldest surviving curfew bells in London. And when sounded an alarm, it was a signal to close all the gates and man these battlements in defence. And it still sounds at the end of each day to notify visitors that the tower grounds will be closing. Now it's had some very important prisoners incarcerated within its walls. Princess Elizabeth was held here by a half-sister, Mary Tudor, also known as Bloody Mary. Now both were daughters of King Edward VIII, but after his split from the Catholic Church, Mary remained true to her faith. Elizabeth, like a father, was Anglican. Now, when Mary became queen, there were many plots against her. She thought Elizabeth was involved, so she had her arrested. Two months passed, no evidence could be found, so she was released, only able to return to this tower some four years later to prepare for her own coronation as Queen Elizabeth I. Now, by far, the shortest stay in this bell tower was that of a man called James Scott. He was the eldest of King Charles II's 13 illegitimate children, who was also known as the Duke of Monmouth. Now, when King Charles died, unbelievably, he had no legitimate son and heir, so his brother was appointed as the new king. Also called James, he was crowned King James I, but, sorry, James II, but James Scott was insistent that his mother had at one time been married to King Charles. This is when Charles was an exile in France, trying to keep it away of a man called Oliver Cromwell, a man who had dared to leave the Republic. Now, if this were true, it made James Scott legitimate with a rightful claim to the throne. Now, he was a popular man. So popular, in fact, he managed to raise an army and challenge the king. Now, a battle took place in 1685 in Sedgemoor, in the west country of England. Unfortunately, James Scott, his army was defeated, he was captured, and he was locked up here in the sense of death. Now, he should stay here for just two nights and one full day before being taken to Tower Hill and publicly beheaded in one of the bloodiest executions this tower has ever seen. Now the execution of this day was a six foot five giant of a man called Jack Ketch. Now Jack Ketch was by trade a butcher. He was also an executioner in the tower and a bit like yourself, sir, he liked to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Not wrong, sir, Mike. <laughs> and on this particular day, he managed to combine all three. Now it took Jack Ketch no less than five strokes of his axe to try and sever the head from the body. Even then it wasn't done. So he took a knife from his belt and he cut through the last piece of sinew, held the head onto the shoulders. Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs> but there's more to this story. In those days it's customary for royalty to have their portrait painted at regular intervals for good record. Now, when James II ascended the throne, James Scott, like his father, had to flee in exile. And shortly after he'd been beheaded, somebody realised that while he'd been in exile, his portrait had not been painted. So a yeoman warder was immediately dispatched to London Bridge to fetch back his head. The royal surgeon was called for to sew the head back onto the body. 
And with the Duke dressed in fine clothes and laid upon a couch, the artist was given just 24 hours to complete the portrait. Ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the National Portrait Gallery tomorrow, you can see that painting and it's easily recognised by the expression on the gentleman's face. <laughs> it's a bit like that one, sir. <laughs> the awesome person in this tower was the man for all seasons. Someone tell me what the man for all seasons was. Beckett. Somebody? Beckett. Who, who said that? What did you say, madam? Sir Thomas More, well done, madam. A private education not wasted on you. <laughs> you don't like private education, but well done, madam. <laughs> Sir Thomas More, he was the Lord Chancellor of England during the reign of King Edward VIII. Now, he was imprisoned for refusing to accept the king as the head of the Church of England. Now, at first, he was rather well treated. He had writing materials, allowed family visits, servants looked after him. But as time went by, the king removed these privileges one by one. So after nearly 15 months, Sir Thomas More was in here with only the clothes upon his back. At the same time, for the same reasons, John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, he was held in the upper chamber. Both these men remained true to their faith, and in 1535 were taken up to Tower Hill and publicly beheaded by the means of block and axe. 400 years later, they were made saints by the Roman Catholic Church, and both still lie here in our chapel royal of St. Peter Advinkin. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a step closer to that chapel and let's be heading around the corner. <laughs> he told me that was a dad joke. Right, have we got any Australians back with us yet? Any Australians at all? Yeah. Okay, welcome home, welcome home. Welcome <laughs> home, sir, welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find out what your granddad did? <laughs> I've got his name in a book and I'll show you what room he was kept in, all right? Good to have you back. Just a second, yeah. Uh, yeah, Crown Jewels here. Yeah, got some Australians in, sir. So. <laughs> <laughs> too careful, can we, sir? So. Uh, right, we have just walked down Water Lane, so called, because until 1280, before they built these outer walls, the River Thames used to wash up on that wall behind you. So we would have all been stood in the river. Also behind you are some windows which light up the King's House. It's the one on the right hand side, halfway up with the half metal balcony. And the large window on the top floor on the right hand side lights up the council chamber. Now it's in that very room that Guy Fawkes was interrogated after the failed gunpowder plot of November 1605. This was the plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament when King James I and all his ministers would have been inside the building. Now, first, Guy Fawkes would not reveal the names of his fellow conspirators. But a torture warrant had been signed by the king, and he was taken down to the basement of the White Tower and laid upon the rack. He later returned to that room, a much taller man, <laughs> and finally revealed the names of his fellow conspirators. Now, although we still celebrate on the 5th of November each year by the lighting of bonfires, setting off of fireworks, it's wrongly assumed that Guy Fawkes was burnt at the stake. He was, in fact, hanged, drawn and quartered at the old Polish Yard Westminster in January 1606. Right, we're now standing at the most famous, or should I say infamous, gate in the world, Traitor's Gate. This was built on the orders of King Edward I because he required a safer, more useful entrance into the tower. Rather than using the twisting narrow streets of London, where convoys could be attacked, stores stolen, prisoners set free, he decided to use the River Thames as a highway so at high tide boats could pass through this gate and load their cargoes in safety. Therefore it's originally known as Watergate. See American friends? <laughs> <laughs> we had Watergate first. <laughs> this one's got a few less leaks in it though. So I'll explain later. Now we realise that having an opening in the outer wall he'd weaken the defences of this premier fortress so we ordered that a tower be built above the gate to defend it. It's called St Thomas's Tower, named after Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was murdered on the steps of Canterbury Cathedral on the order of his grandfather in 1170. Now it's a marvel of medieval architecture with the archway spanning some 61 feet and you may notice it hasn't got a keystone. But when did it become known as Traitor's Gate? This occurred during the Tudor period because the large amount of prisoners that entered this mighty fortress through this grim gate. Amongst them, three queens of England, Queen Anne Boleyn, Queen Catherine Howard 
and Lady Jane Grey. And they're still laying here to this day. Now behind, ladies and gentlemen, is the Wakefield Tower. Now it's in on the 21st of May, 1471, that King Henry VI was murdered, stabbed in the back whilst at prayer. In fact, there's his ghost there now, look. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time I've ever seen that. <laughs> That's <is> spooky, that. <laughs> <laughs> There's more of them. <laughs> <laughs> Today. <laughs> anyway, where were we? 1471. King Henry VI was murdered, stabbed in the, stabbed in the back whilst at prayer. King Henry is remembered as the founder of Eton College and King's College, Cambridge. And every year on the anniversary of his death, deans from the college take part in a memorial service and they lay sheaves of white lilies and white roses on the spot where he died. The flowers remain there for 24 hours before being taken away and burned. Now beside the Wakefield Tower is the infamous Bloody Tower. Its original name was the Garden Tower because it overlooked Lieutenant's Garden. But its name was changed to the Tower of Blood during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I because of the many dark deeds which occur within its walls. Surely the darkest of them all was the alleged murder of the two boy princes in 1483. Now the death of their father, King Edward IV, young Prince Edward and his younger brother Richard Duke of York aged as 12 and 9 were brought to the tower by their uncle Richard Duke of Gloucester. Soon after he arrived he declared them illegitimate so Uncle Richard became King Richard the third. Soon after those boys disappeared he said they were never seen alive again. Now King Richard the third died two years later at the Battle of Bosworth Field. Soon after he died a man came forward and he admitted to smothering the princes up there in a bedroom. 191 years after they disappeared, the remains of two small boys were found in a chest underneath some stairs leading to the White Tower. Experts of the day declared they were indeed the missing princes. On the orders of the King, they moved to Westminster Abbey where they re-interned <coughs> in a place known as Innocent Corner. Named in their honour would the boast of lie to this day. If you're intending to go to Westminster Abbey Willie here in London, please go and visit that spot. It's a very sad part of English history. This was Buckingham Palace of its day for its first five years. This was the tallest building in England when it was built. Work began in 1078. It took 20 years to complete. Under direction of a man called the Gundolf of Beck, he was the Bishop of Rochester. It stands over 90 feet tall. The walls are 50 feet at the base, tapering to 11 feet at the top. And on each corner you'll see there stands a turret. Three of them are square, but the one in the northeast corner is round because it was in there that the commercial observatory was established to move to Greenwich in 1675. And above each turret you will see that there is a crown in gold leaf. And below that there's a weather vane showing the royal standard. This denotes that this is still a royal palace. And although no longer a royal residence, it served, as I said, for its first 500 years. Now, the royal apartments were on the top floor. The floor below that was a council chamber. It was a banqueting hall. It was accommodation for knights and their ladies and the chapel of St. John the Evangelist. The floor below that was used for servants and their retainers. <coughs> but there was another floor without any windows. But there was another floor without any windows. Oh. This is the pantomime country, for goodness sake. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. Madam, have a guess what that floor was used for. Torture. Red wine, madam, is a royal palace. <laughs> you look like a lady that knows about red wine. <laughs> no, but you're right. It was a dark and evil smelling place and only lit by the torturous candles. No cries or anguish have been heard outside of those thick walls. Today, it's brightly lit and very little trace remains of its form use. In fact, today, it's another one of our gift shops. <laughs> and ladies, if you find yourself down there later on today, you will see that the prices are still equally torturous. <laughs> this was Buckingham Palace of its day for its first five years. This was the tallest building in England when it was built. Work began in 1078. It took 20 years to under the direction of a man called the Gundolf of Beck, he was the Bishop of Rochester. It stands over 90 feet tall. The walls are 50 feet at the base, tapering to 11 feet at the top. 
Now on each corner you'll see there stands a turret. Three of them are square, but the one in the northeast corner is round because it was in there that a commercial observatory was established to move to Greenwich in 1675. And above each turret you will see that there is a crown in gold leaf. And below that there's a weather vane showing the royal standard. This denotes that this is still a royal palace. And although no longer a royal residence, it served, as I said, for its first 500 years. Now the royal apartments on the top floor, the floor below that was a council chamber. It was a banqueting hall. It was accommodation for knights and their ladies and the chapel of St John the Evangelist. The floor below that was used for servants and their retainers. <coughs> but there was another floor without any windows. But there was another floor without any windows. Oh. This is the pantomime country, for goodness sake. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. Madam, have a guess what that floor was used for. Torture, red wine, madam, is a royal palace. <laughs> you look like a lady that knows about red wine. <laughs> No, but you're right, it was a dark and evil smelling place and only lit by the torturous candles. No cries or anguish have been heard outside of those thick walls. Today, it's brightly lit and very little trace remains of its form use. In fact, today, it's another one of our gift shops. <laughs> and ladies, if you find yourself down there later on today, you will see that the prices are still equally torturous. <laughs> right, behind me in the grassy is the home of our Tower Ravens. And there's an ancient legend about these large birds. Now, when William the Conqueror won the Battle of Hastings, he fought under the banner of a raven. And when he decided to settle here and build this fortress, he rested his banner here and he stated, as long as the banner stands, England will be protected. So the legend states that if the ravens ever leave, this white tower will crumble to dust and a great disaster will befall the monarchy. So by our royal decree of King Charles II, we must keep six ravens here at all times. So, ladies and gentlemen, do you think in 2024 we believe in old legends like that? Do you think we keep six ravens? Yes. We don't, we keep seven. <laughs> we keep one spare just in case one stuffs him overnight and we can sneak him out in the morning. <laughs> okay, we're now standing on Tower Green, which is the village green of the Tower of London. Now, some village greens have a duck pond, some are large enough to have a cricket pitch. However, ours has its very own private execution site. <laughs> this glass sculpture there stands in memory of the private executions. And it's not to be confused with the public gallows that we were talking about at the beginning of the tour that were up on Tower Hill. Six people were beheaded here. Three of those were Queens of England. But before I tell you about them, let me tell you about these buildings that are now surrounding us on Tower Green. Down this path to my right, you're going to come to the Bloody Tower where you're going to see displays of Sir Walter Raleigh and the two boy princes we were talking about down at Traitor's Gate. Moving to the right, the impressive Tudor building in the corner, that is the King's House. That's one of the last perfectly preserved Tudor buildings we've got left in London. Anyone will tell me why we've got no more Tudor buildings left? What year? 1666, every day is a school day in the Tower of London. That's now the home of the Council of the Tower of London, General Messenger. He spent 40 years as a Royal Marine when he retired a year last April, he was invited to Buckingham Palace by the Queen who was still alive then, God rest her soul. She said to him, would you like to be my 161st Constable of the Tower of London? Live in a grace and favour house overlooking the River Thames for the rest of your days. He obviously took the weekend to think about it. <laughs> now lives there with his family. He was the third most important man at the coronation that we had last, uh, when was it? Last September. Was it last September or last May? When was it? Last May. He was the man that was carrying the black cushion that had the King Edward crown on that was placed onto the King's head by the Archbishop. The reason I know that is because he was escorted from the Tower of London by six beefeaters in that morning all the way to Westminster, right down the aisle to stand next to the throne by six beefeaters. I was one of those beefeaters that did that job. <laughs> now listen, I'm gonna tell you now, that man is a true gentleman and I'll tell you why. When the coronation finished, the only way to get back to the Tower was to utilize the river. And because because all the roads were closed, and because he's an ex war Marine, still in his uniform, wearing our state reds, we went down to Westminster Pier and he commandeered one of the city crew's tourist boats. <laughs> it had 100 American tourists on that boat. We got on that boat and we, we, it was a 20 minute journey back to Tower Pier. 
He bought us four beef, uh, us six beef eaters, four pints of beer in 20 minutes. <laughs> now listen, any man that buys me four pints of beer in 20 minutes, in my eyes, is a true gentleman. So what a great, great guy. So some very important prisoners incarcerated in there. Queen Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of King Edward VIII. Uh, she was uh, 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 held there before her execution. Also William Penn, in prison for his offensive writings. And even as a prisoner, he compiled the controversial pamphlet no cross, no crown. He was released on condition of the country and crossing the Atlantic he founded... Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Need to be proud of that one, American friends. British convict. Get yourself over to America, thank you very much. <laughs> also there was the deputy leader of Nazi Germany, Rudolf Hess. He was heading there in May of 1941. What was going on in London in 1941? We had the Blitz, exactly. We don't want to lose him. He was a very precious prisoner to us. So we moved him out to Wales to the end of the war for his own safety. The houses you can see either side of the King's House with the green doors, they're more beefy to houses for us to live in. That building there is the Beecham Tower, that's the main state prison during the Tudor period. Make sure you visit the two floors there, you're going to see graffiti on the walls there that's over 500 years old. Oh. Moving to the right, the four storey residence, that is the home of our tower doctor. Now if we get poorly at night, we can't dial 999 and get an ambulance, we need to go and see him. And if he can't help us, we pop next door, because that's the residence of the Tower Chaplain. Mm. <laughs> and this is where he works one day a week in the chapel wall of St Peter Advincula. He has got the shortest commute in London. He walks out of that green door for half a day a week, which is this morning, works in there and lives in that fantastic house. When he retires later on this year, I'm going to apply for that job. <laughs> I know nothing about religion, but what a great job to work in there, working there for half a day a week. I'm going to wing it, I think that's what I'll do soon. <laughs> this building there, that's called the Waterloo Block, celebrate when we beat the French. Yay. When we beat the French, okay, we're very little bit united, you need to make the most of them. It's now the home of the Crown Jewels and Royal Regalia. If you've not seen them, and you can see them by joining that non existent queue over there. Every day, people say to me, Spike, are they the real Crown Jewels? Listen, we wouldn't go to all this trouble of two thick walls, a moat, 35 beef eaters, 12 armed soldiers, and then King Charles keeps them in his top drawing, Buckingham Palace. <laughs> they are the real deal, and you can see them later on when we finish this tour over here. Uh, and by the way, I will mention our soldiers. They are real British Army soldiers in a real uniform. Every day, tourists come to London. They think it's hysterical to stand at a fence line and upload ridiculous videos belittling our soldiers to put on TikTok. They could have been out in Iraq or Afghanistan. They could be going out to Ukraine shortly. They deserve your respect. So I'd be great if you're all happy to comply with that. Everybody happy to comply with that? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Now the sad part, I'm afraid, the executions. The first person to be executed behind me was the second wife of King Emma VIII, Anne Boleyn. She was tried and found guilty on charges of incest, adultery, and even witchcraft. Now she was beheaded, not with the axe, which he feared so greatly, but by her own request, in the French manner, with a two-handed sword. Lord God, have pity on my miserable soul, were the final words of our most infamous queen. Five years later, it was the turn of Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury, the last of the Plantagenet family. This lady had committed no crime, she had no trial. So why was she executed? Because she was the mother of Cardinal Reginald Pole, and it was he that the king would dearly love to get his hands on. But the cardinal, he was safe in Rome, preaching against the king after his break from the Catholic Church. And as the king couldn't get the son, he took his mother instead. This brave 67-year-old lady refused to put her head on the block. So the inexpect executioner literally hacked her to pieces where she stood. Oh. The following year, in 1542, the axe was to twice on the same day. This time the victims were Queen Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, and her lady-in-waiting. Now Catherine was executed for associations with other men, both before and during her marriage. But it was to be her affair with Thomas Culpepper that was proved to be her final undoing. According to popular folklore, her final words were, I die a queen, but I'd rather die the wife of Culpepper. <laughs> Jane Boleyn, the Viscountess of Rochford, her lady in waiting, she was executed immediately afterwards. Her crime was she knew of the adultery, but neglected to tell the king. Now it's to be 12 years before the axe fell again, and this time the victim was the uncrowned Queen of England of only nine days, Lady Jane Grey. 
Now, on the death of her cousin, Edward VI, she was declared queen by ambitious relatives. Her father and three brothers pushed this young 16-year-old girl onto the throne. She was to rule for just nine days from that white tower before the rightful heir, Queen Mary Tudor, rode into London. Now, she had her imprisoned in the gentleman jailer's house, number five, Tower Green. It's the left-hand green door over there. And from the upstairs window, she would have seen her young 18-year-old husband, Lord Guildford Dudley, being, sorry, man, just step back a little bit. Lord Guildford Dudley being taken from the Beecham Tower and marched up to Tower Hill for, a public, for his public execution. A short while later, she would have seen his headless body returning for burial in this chapel. Now, if this were not anguish enough for this young 16-year-old girl, she'd also seen the carpenters prepare the scaffold for her very own execution later that same day. Another sad part of English history. Now, those and many more poor unfortunate souls have found their final resting place in this beautiful chapel, the Chapel Royal of St. Peter Ad Vincula, St. Peter in Chains. Now, after St. Paul's Cathedral and Westminster Abbey, this is the most important burial site in the country. Many important people are buried with great dignity in those two other great churches. However, this little chapel represents the other side of the coin. Some of the most infamous people in history are buried in there. There would have been no ceremony, no friends or relatives at the graveside, not even a priest in attendance. Altogether, over 1,500 headless bodies lay beneath that chapel floor. Three queens of England lay beneath the altar. Queen Anne Boleyn, Queen Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey. Every day people say to me, Spike, is this place haunted? I have lived here for 273 years <laughs> and I have never seen a ghost. <laughs> that is a true story, young lady. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> now, before you leave me now, I'm going to enjoy the rest of the, uh, rest of the tower here. I'm going to answer three questions for you. Three questions I get asked on a day. Well, I'm going to tell you questions, all right? <laughs> this is not a, it's not a Q&A, all right? <laughs> okay. First question say to me, Spike, uh, well, what does the CR stand for on my uniform? Well, I will emphasize that this is a uniform. It's not a costume or an outfit. I'm not going to be Mickey Mouse or Donald up tomorrow. I am number 402 of only 422 people that's ever worn this uniform. More people have been to space than that, which is a quote I use when I'm in the pub on a Friday night. Anybody can be an astronaut, can't they? I want to tell me what the C stands for, young lady. You had your hand up. Someone to help her out? Charles, well done. What's the R stand for? Not royal, I will help her out. Regina, that's queen, that's queen, sir. You obviously dropped Latin what, when you were 13, didn't you? <laughs> or did you do Latin at all, did you? You got to school, in fact. Exactly. I'm going to help you out, what does the R stand for? Rex. Rex, exactly right, Rex. Learn that, so don't forget that. You'll need that for the quiz at the end, right? It's 75% pass mark at the end. If you don't pass, we need to go right back to the beginning and do it all again. <laughs> Okay, second question we say, Spike, how do you get this job? How do you get to be a beef eater? We are all retired warrant officers from the British Armed Forces, from the British Army, the Royal Air Force of the Royal Navy. You need to serve a minimum of 22 years military service. I personally, I did 35 years with the Royal Air Force. If you're trying to do the mass at the moment, ladies, I joined the Air Force when I was 11 years old. <laughs> this lady is saying there's no way that man can be 61. And you need the Long Service Good Conduct Medal. It's a medal on the end here. It means you're generally full military career with honours because you're coming into a place of trust. You're going to be a King's bodyguard, you look after the crown jewels. 45 people applied for the position when I came here. I'm the gentleman that got the job. It's going to get my name painted in gold on the board in that chapel where, where and I pass away where kings and queens are buried. So you can see it's a great honour to be a yeoman warder. And the final question is, why are we called beef eaters? Now, when you find that out, come back, tell us. <laughs> Comes back way back in the past when you got a job in the White Towers, a king's bodyguard, people in the local area said, you're lucky now, you'll be able to eat beef off the king's table. We got paid in beef, take beef home to our families. So that's probably comes from. Okay, as I said, we judge our tolls by how loud you clap and cheer. I hope we get a better cheer than that last gentleman, that little one just now. Thank you very much. Yeah! That was awesome. That was a good tour. Yeah.
Thank you. 